Okay. I'd like to call a regular meeting at Council to order Monday, November 16th, 2020. Uh, approval of the agenda, please. Councillor Norbury. That's the Monday, November 16th, 2020. That the Monday, November 16th, 2020, regular council meeting agenda be adopted as presented. Seconder, Council Majinski. All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Adoption of the minutes. November 2nd, 2020, regular council meeting minutes. Recommendation, please. Councilor Majinski. Got the Monday. <clears throat> Got the minutes from the Monday, November 2nd, 2020. Council meeting. Council meeting about this presented. I'll try that again. I'm having a hard time talking and pressing buttons at the same time here. At the minutes of the Monday, November 2nd, 2020, regular council meeting. Uh, Adopted as presented. Seconder. Councillor Lehman. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Any business arising from the minutes, Council? Staff, any anything? Thank you. Okay, moving on to delegations. We have Canadian Fiber Optics. A presentation by Canadian Fiber Optics regarding high speed internet. And on the line I we have Jody. Is that correct? That's right, yes. Hi, Jody. The floor is yours. Hi. Announcing participant, Art Kalwa. Well, that's perfect time, actually. So we also have Mark Kalwa from Sandbox Systems joining us for our presentation. Uh, Jason Pressman and Jared, I'm sorry, I always get your last name wrong, but Kupiak, I believe, um, from Calix as well so I would like to just thank you very much for having us and sincerely apologize for not being there in person with COVID counts increasing we felt that it was more appropriate to do this online so I'm sorry I'm not able to see your faces read body language um, so I'm not quite clear on what the protocol is but we're very open to um, interruptions where appropriate to ask questions um, and make sure that our message is, is coming across clear and our communication is also clear. Absolutely, thank you. And so with that, maybe I'll just, um, if, and I, I can't see, but if, if you could please go to slide uh, two, working together to connect Tumblr Ridge. Yep. You can see our faces. Um, I'm maybe just going to hand it over to Jason and Jared to just say a, a quick hello. Um, we've got Calix here, um, if you're able to. Yep, can you guys hear me? Yep, sure can. Yep. Perfect. It's usually how these things start. Can you, can you hear me? Can you see me? Anyway, uh, Jason Pressman. I'm the Regional Vice President of Sales for Calix in Canada, and I am based out of the Toronto area. Happy to be here today. Thank you, Jason. And uh, Jerry Kubiak, I'm a senior solutions engineer in Western Canada. Uh, so I'm based out of Regina, Saskatchewan, and I had done some of the work with the Tumblr Ridge team and the Pris team, uh, I guess a year ago or so, with uh, initially assessing bringing some of these high-speed projects into, uh, into the area. Excellent. Thank you, Jared. And uh, Mark Hall will with Sandbox System as well. I'll, I'll hand it to you. Hi, uh, it's Mark here. And um, I'm in Invermere, BC, so understand a little bit, um, understand what it's like to do rural broadband in BC. It's kind of challenging and uh, do a number of things in there, typically around the funding, but also um, doing market analysis and determining when networks make financial sense and when they don't. And when we find one that makes financial sense, I become the money guy and go look for, uh, for the funds to build it. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. And I'm Jody Bloomer Kaput. I'm a co-founder and chief business development officer for Canadian Fiber Optics. And I am in Calgary today, but we are a Peace Country based uh, rural, residential, and inter industrial internet service provider with in house construction. I unfortunately don't have Ken Chomick, my construction manager, on with me. He was pulled away 
in the field where we don't have uh, cell phone service. I'm sure you guys can believe that. Um, if I was talking to city folks, I would say if you could believe that, but I know that's also what, what you guys experience. Absolutely. Um, if we could go to the third slide, please. So this touch on the current state. So this is actually a speed test um, from a Tumblr Ridge resident that, that reached out. Um, if, if you're not familiar, if you go to speedtest.com or if you Google speed test, there'll be various options that will show what your up and download speeds are and, and various other interesting things if you're a bit of an internet geek. And this, um, unfortunately, the internet wasn't strong enough to, to provide the speed test. And so it's just a, a sort of example to illustrate some of the issues um, and our understanding of the issues that you guys will experience um, both in the town site of Tumblr Ridge, but I'm also aware that the industrial area surrounding Tumblr Ridge uh, certainly is also challenging. Um, this map is from ICED, Innovation Science and Economic Development. You'll see in the legend here that let's say 45 or so percent of the community has access to a 5010 service and the remaining has a 10 and 2 service. So there's a pretty big discrepancy in what is um, being offered in the town. And the federal government has suggested that a 5010 service is satisfactory and that is the goal of these big funding announcements that you're hearing about is that uh, providers are offering a minimum of a 5010 service. We can certainly touch on that later if there are any other questions. Uh, no. I just wanted to capture our understanding of the District of Tumble Ridge's needs. I think it's quite straightforward. Um, connect residents, businesses, and industry to um, high speed and resilient internet. Um, of course, to ensure high service levels and fair pricing to the end customers as well. And on to slide five. So Tumble Ridge is quite an interesting community, a beautiful community, but also quite an interesting community. You guys sure did things right when the town was being built. In, in, in overbuilding conduit, putting a five inch conduit in uh, while the ground was open was a really wise step to take. And so when we're looking at Tumblr Ridge, we're certainly aware that there's some history of previous initiatives to get connected, um, working with uh, some other internet service providers, working through uh, various grant applications. And my understanding is that a lot of work has actually gone into it. So we certainly want to be respectful of that. Um, and should there be any questions, Jared was involved, as he mentioned in his introduction, on the design and engineering side. Um, I guess I'll cut to the chase. What we're looking to do here today is, is truly find a way to access that existing conduit so that we can build you guys a resilient and scale, scalable fiber optic network. So bring fiber throughout the community, fiber to every home. And how we were, would be proposing to do that is accessing the existing telecommunications duct. And hope I'm not getting too far ahead of myself. I can't read body language, but the next steps, you know, for us would be understanding the appetite to access the duct work with Sandbox System to create a plan in order to apply for some funding, work with the existing design that's in place, ensure that we are engaging the community to understand the service requirements and provide accordingly. And following that, we would we love to build a reliable and scalable robust fiber optic network and get your residents and businesses connected to high-speed internet. Excellent. So maybe I'll just pause there to see if there are any questions. I've, you know, we've done a high-level introduction. We'll certainly get more into some company profiles so you have an understanding a little bit more about who we are. Um, but very open to any questions at this point. Thank you, Jody, and uh, we absolutely appreciate you guys, all of you, um, on the line tonight and and presenting this uh, this presentation to us tonight. Any questions so far, Council? No. Okay, uh, Councillor Lehman. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm just wondering how much better it's going to get than the 5010. 
I'm sorry, just to, I'll just repeat the question to make sure I've understood. Um, how much better uh, fiber internet would be um, better than 5010? Is that what I heard? Yep, that's correct. That's an excellent question. Um, Darren, I, I would love for, for, for you to answer in more depth. I guess the high level answer to that question would just be that um, we would, where we're launching our residential services, we're launching with a minimum of 100 megabytes per second, so twice as fast, and then offering uh, 1,000 megabytes per, per second. But Jared, if you could maybe take a couple of moments to just add to the scalability of, of fiber optic, I think that would be I just have been super. Jared, could you ask Calix? I think, I think Jared just accidentally exited, if I heard correctly. <laughs> Maybe it was an exit instead so, of a mute. Jason, yeah. would you answer for us? Yeah, so I can talk to it. I mean, if, if you take a look at, and I'm not going to go into a physics lesson here, but if you take a look at the different media that are out there, so you've got wireless, you've Announcing got... Announcing participant. Jared, Jared, Jared. Back. You've got wireless, you've got coax, you've got um, uh, fiber optic cable. Fiber optic... It completely surpasses any of those medium in terms of the actual broadband capacity that it has or the capacity that it has to carry data. So in terms of 5010, I mean, going up to basically the ability to do terabytes per second on fiber, um, it, it's a completely different infrastructure. Uh, the, 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 you put it in once and, and you can keep building on it over time um, and, and keep loading services on top of it. So the fact that 5010 is what the universal service standard is from the, the CRTC, um, many folks believe that that's not nearly enough over time to be able to, to carry what, you know, what, what the demand of, of the consumers are going to be over time. So fiber just gives you the ability to keep expanding over time without having to change the infrastructure out as you deliver new services. Perfect. Thank you very much. And Jody, I've got a quick question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm just wondering what um, Canadian Fiber Optics has been involved with with the regional district. I know they're presently or have gotten a study done and presently um, putting together a working group. So I'm just curious if if you were involved with the regional district at all. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, so Canadian Fiber Optics have partnered with a company called Bailo Networks to respond to the RFP last November, and we were selected to provide the strategy. Um, so that was submitted late spring of, of last year. Um, Canadian Fiber Optics and Bailo Networks, we're, we're no longer working together. We actually now have the technical side in-house, and we're also working closely with Calix, who, who we've now met. And uh, Bailo is doing the working group at the regional level. Canadian Fiber Optics, though, is in process of better understanding the region as a whole. Um, we are speaking to some of the mayors and, and directors to make sure that we are understanding what the needs are in different areas. Our connection with industry is something that we feel is definitely a value add in looking at the region as, as a whole and stitching together additional network and network expansion. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Okay. Um, if there's anything else, Jordy, go ahead. Sure. All right. So moving from slide uh, five, how do it to the Canadian Fiber Optics Project lifestyle, uh, life, lifestyle, life cycle. <laughs> um, so just you know, quick graphic here, guys, to show um, with the steps that we take that we feel are important. In, in engaging with the community, connecting with the community. So stage one is engagement. So we've done a little bit of engagement so far. Um, Steve Torrey has been instrumental in that process. Um, had some conversations also um, with Mr. Powell, um, as well as Ms. Ms. Torreville. I'm sorry if I'm saying last name so a little bit wrong. And we've engaged with uh, all three major coal mines as well to make sure that we're understanding their wants and their needs and what their current sort of choke points are as well. There's certainly further engagement to do specifically at a community level to understand residential needs, understand future expansion, and better understand all of industry. Um, and that would be a part of the next step that we would take. Um, 
Of course, we then initiate the project and for us what that would look like. With Tumblr Ridge is understanding the appetite to uh, grant access or uh, pursue understanding how to, let's say, grant access to that conduit. A lot of the design has been done um, thanks to, to Jared and Calix. And from there, the procurement and permitting process would take place. Um, we'd sell the services, we'd build it, and we'd light it. So it's, um, it's a relatively simple process. You know, we joke in the office that we're not putting people on the moon, we're not building rockets. We're just putting conduit in the ground, or in this case, hoping to use existing conduit, putting fiber through there, using electronics that Calix has worked hard to, um, to create and, and really lighting the network. So um, looking to try to keep it simple here and so making sure that we are engaging um, and initiating in the way that, um, that will, I guess, create the most benefit for the community. Absolutely. On the following slide, we wanted to illustrate that building rural fiber optic network is possible I guess not having spoken to individual counselors at this point, um, but spoken to having spoke to various council members, various administrators and executive development officers across many different jurisdictions, it sometimes seems like there's last hope that rural connectivity is possible. We hear of TELUS and Bell, and I certainly don't say any of this to uh, make anybody wrong, but they're spending billions uh, in our various provinces, um, but the rurals aren't seeing any positive effect of that. And so here are the facts with Grand Cash specifically, which I, I think of as a sort of sister com uh, community to Tumblr Ridge. In Grand Cash, there are about 1,700 uh, premises. It was 200 kilometers from the nearest reliable backbone. Uh, there was less than one gigabyte per second of bandwidth available to serve the entire 1700 premise community. It was a mining town, um, still is, but the mine is currently shut down and is surrounded by oil, gas, and uh, forestry. And of course, they're desperate for reliable and affordable high-speed internet. And like Tumblr Ridge, they're built on pit runs. So we looked at the facts, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking and analyzing Grand Cash and, and how we can solve for the, for the problems in Grand Cash, uh, largely being just a lack of connectivity, um, but a lack of access and then being quite remote. And so our plan was let's figure out how to build fiber to the premise. We're going to connect to our fiber optic backbone, which I will uh, explain in a little bit more detail or showcase in a little bit more detail in a further slide. And the plan is to bring big bandwidth to Grand Cash so that we can properly serve the community. And it's important that we engage industry and have guaranteed service levels. So rather than the coal mine saying, oh great, I'll take whatever you can get, we offer a 99.999% uh, uptime. And we offer a mean time to, rep to repair that certainly rivals what uh, tell us the current provider is able to offer. So we'd like to meet industry uh, where, where, where they are and for what their needs truly are. And then we engaged with the community to, again, make sure we're understanding their needs. And so we'll be offering a 100 megabyte per second service, a 250 megabyte per second service, and a uh, gigabyte per second service. And there are no data caps on what we offer. So unlike your cell phone, when you've uh, been surfing online or maybe playing games or researching a few too many times, uh, we, we don't have those, those data caps. And to solve for the pit run challenges, we're actually using a composite pole that North, Northwest Tel used on a build uh, towards Whitehorse. Uh, it's, Grand Cash was an interesting community. They didn't have any poles in the residential area uh, in their back alleys. They do have back alleys, which um, the majority of, of Tumblr Ridge does not, so just to compare and contrast. And so because they didn't, they'll have the foresight to put extra duct in or big duct in, the right of ways are very busy in Grand Cash. And so that was another reason for us to use composite poles that de risk the investment and it allows for us also to deploy much more quickly without compromising existing underground infrastructure, uh, water, gas, etc. Jordi, I just need to stop you there for a moment. Next. 
Jody, I'm sorry, I I'm just sorry? need to interrupt and stop you there for a moment. I just need to make a motion to continue the delegation. Second, Council. Councilor Norbury, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Sorry, Jody, go ahead. No worries. Um, slide eight, if, if we could, please. The Grand Cash timeline. So in July of 2020, we launched our survey on our website. We have a survey. Uh, it's actually going to be updated in the next couple of days um, to include a little bit more information. And the MD of Greenview, the local government and the governing body of Grand Cash, uh, did promote the survey, which we were grateful for. We got some excellent feedback from the community. Um, August 2020, we chartered the Fiber to the Premise project and we were able to meet on site with the MD of Greenview Infrastructure team and share at a high level our design concept. The first half of September, we were able to submit our design, posted two open houses in a safe way, uh, considering that COVID was, of course, still, uh, it, was, it was there and it still is. And we uh, did a lot of community engagement on social media as well. We presented to Committee of the Whole, hosted an additional, additional open house, and found community champions to really support the initiative. And the presentation to Committee of the Whole was our overall project and strategy, but also a request for approval uh, for the poll infrastructure. And that was approved October 13th. We've just uh, received our permitting uh, a little bit later than what we'd hoped, but we're still on track to light our first customers just before Christmas. The next slide, just further highlighting uh, our desire and need for community engagement. It truly is, and our, um, from our standpoint, the key to success. And this is just an example of our survey uh, that we do have online. We then take that survey and we put it onto a map to understand who has responded and then better understand what the response is. Um, and again, engage social media, have open houses, and um, find community champions who are really passionate about the initiative. Slide 10 is just our, our, our open house, a, a little bit cheap with the right tent. It was, um, of course, considering COVID, it was kind of the best that we were able to, to do rather than being in a hall or, or something we wanted to make sure we were safe. And the slide 11, uh, I think some of what Grant Cash is saying here, if you are to read, some of the messaging would probably not be so dissimilar to to your residents and yourself, maybe even depending on, on the area of Tumblr Ridge you live. And then we just got a graphic of our plan. And just moving to slide 12. So this is our current uh, Northwest backbone. And so we were originally built to provide reliable high-speed internet to heavy industry south of Grand Prairie. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a co-founder, and the original plan was to serve the energy industry. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with uh, Highway 40 south of Grand Prairie. I imagine uh, a lot of you very well uh, will be. There's no cell phone service in some areas, let alone proper connectivity, and there was no fiber. So the energy companies south of town were literally spending billions of dollars, but they weren't able to take advantage of the industrial internet of things or just general health and safety applications or sensors or um, just plain connectivity in a lot of instances. And so our, our plan really expands to then build into the residential space, the small medium sized business space and we've been very fortunate to have the ability to connect uh, 620 houses on the islands of Haida Gwaii and that project we, we worked with Mark Hawa who, who's on the call with Sandbox Systems and uh, we've, we've built also in the Red Deer County area. But this is our owned network. We crossed, I'm so proud of the, of the guys, they crossed 225 live pipelines, um, several rivers and streams, and of course you're on tons of rock and stone. Mm -hmm. And uh, slide 13 is uh, just a little bit about, you know, why us, why would anybody want to work with us? So we are back with two families, um, my family and another family, the Welsh family, who actually comes from the Peace River area, um, I'm sorry, the Peace River Regional District area, um, sort of around Dawson Creek. Um, we've invested several millions of dollars in our infrastructure between Numbly and Grand Cash, as well through Grovedale, Landry Heights, and uh, La Glass to Heights. 
-hmm. Our mission is to provide the foundation of connectivity to forward-thinking communities and businesses. We do aim to enable access to new and evolving technology. So we sort of joke that what we do is a little bit boring. Um, what we do is just lay the foundation. Um, but it's really, it's, it's, it's really what we enable. It's very exciting. And we, we do try to bring connectivity to all within our reach, and that certainly includes the businesses and the industry in the area. Um, and we just quickly touch on the competitive advantage. We, we're entrepreneurial in our spirit. I think we've illustrated that in our uh, use of, of, of a creative approach, let's say, to building in grand, grand cash, um, researching and finding the composite poles, and, and doing all that we can to get that done in a very short time period. Um, having in-house construction is also a, a huge competitive advantage to us. It's it, it saves 20 to 40 percent of construction costs, or uh, put differently, allows for us to build 20 to 40 percent more infrastructure. Um, and maybe from there, I, I'm very aware I'm taking quite a bit of your time. I'll just jump to slide 14 and then hand it to to Calix. And so we're a, a you know medium-sized entrepreneurial company. Uh, we have the ability to offer flexible models, and we tailor solutions to the needs and the demands of communities we serve. Uh, we do have that get or done mentality and we're very aware that connectivity is needed now more than ever and that our residents and businesses in rural and remote Western Canada can't wait any longer. Couldn't these are our equipment, these are our crews actually work as well and uh, from there I will just hand it to, to Calix. So in the interest of time, let me, and, and the, you guys have the deck there so you can see some of this. Um, I'm just going to give you a real quick overview of, you know, who we are and really what we do. I mean, from a company perspective, I've uh, been around since the late 90s. Uh, the company has been always a, a focus on delivering services over different broadband infrastructure. Really what we're doing now is working with service providers of all sizes, uh, sorry, municipalities and service providers of all sizes across North America. The extent to which we're working with municipalities overall, we've enabled over, I would say, North American wise, 250 to 300 um, municipalities with fiber-based services with our with our partners, uh, like CFOC and, and certainly um, the, the folks we're working with at, at Sandbox Systems as well and Mark. The the products and services that we provide are effectively the the bits and pieces that light up the fiber, right? So the electronics that go on the fiber to move the data around, um, including being able to have managed Wi-Fi solutions inside the home and, and whatnot. But the focus that we've had specifically around enabling municipal infrastructure and municipal ecosystem in Canada and the U.S. has, has been a, a forefront greenfield initiative for us over the past at least 18 months. Um, a quick example of that, there is a, a conference that's run in Canada, the Canadian Rural and Remote Broadband Conference, and that's something that we've been a founding sponsor and, and certainly part of right from the beginning. So our, our model is, is typically to work with the different service, the different Sorry, the, the different service providers, I'm calling um, Canadian Fiber Optics a service provider, the different service providers in the different areas who put the infrastructure in the ground and then we work to light up that infrastructure to deliver the, you know, deliver the bits to the different locations and, um, and move the traffic around. So that's a, that's, I, I didn't want to take too much time, that's a real high level of where we are. Jared, I don't know if you want to jump in here and talk about what uh, some of the work that was done in 2019, but quickly before that, any sort of questions um, of, of who Calix is and why we're here and, and what we've done and what we bring to the table. Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions? No, none so far. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Jared, if you want to just touch on some of this that you've uh, worked on before. Yeah, sure. So just uh, a few quick words. Um, so uh, I guess several, you may be well aware of, of the background on, on what uh, kind of went on in 2018, 2019 to initially look at some of the uh, um, broadband high-speed projects. So, you know, Calix working with service providers, we were approached by, by Chris to work on this project. Um, you know, we went, we worked with um, the team, came up with a full design, sent people to the field, um, assessed all the conduit that was in the ground, uh, did a detailed level design costing with a complete uh, uh, proposal with um, not CFOC as a construction partner, but, but another uh, outfit. You know, and then it really at that point it was it was with uh, Chris and the municipality to uh, decide how to move forward and 
through whatever arrangements were being worked out with Chris and and Oxa, you know the, the applications for access to the conduit. You know it, it all just kind of ended up falling apart for whatever reason. So we we're somewhat disappointed. And um, but this has always been on on the back of our minds and, and on the back burner to see if we could revive this in some capacity. And when we started working with uh, CFOC, we had seen a lot of their success in working in other jurisdictions, and we're working with them up in that Grand Cash area. So we did start bringing the idea of, of approaching Tumblr Ridge again. Um, back to the table, and, and there was a lot of interest on, on all parties involved here. So excited to see if we can we can revive this and, and make it actually go. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Maybe we'll hand it to Mark, and if you could provide some background on on Sandbooks and and, and yourself and the great projects that that you have uh, spearheaded. Mark, you. Still there, Mark? Still there. Oh, there you are. If you, can you hear me now? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just in the interest of time, I, I probably gave you enough of an overview before. Um, my approach is, is to you know focus on the fundamentals of the network and make sure that it it works. Um, I I can. Uh, put together plans and find the money, but I really like to focus on what do we need to make the network work from the outset. So Jared actually, who was just speaking, uh, dug up a memo off of your website um, dated October 21st, 2019, which talks about the conduit within Tumblr Ridge. Uh, Jordan at the time when he was the CAO put it together. And the conduit is probably the biggest fundamental that um, needs to be addressed right out of the gate. And I was just curious if you have an agreement, if you um, got an agreement which maybe isn't signed, or would you be willing to pursue uh, trying to get an agreement? Because that's kind of what makes the whole network work. You probably have a community with, um, because it's not that old, comparatively speaking, uh, pretty good roads and things are in good shape and you don't want somebody to bring in a bunch of heavy equipment and, and uh, make a mess of things. So with that said, do you mind if I um, skip the commercial and just ask you about the conduit and um, where you're at in, in finding an agreement that governs it? Yeah, I appreciate that, Mark. Um, we haven't, uh, as far as I understand, the conduit is old BC Tel uh, infrastructure, and um, so now as far as we understand, currently owned by TELUS, but uh, we can certainly investigate that more. Um, we haven't to this point yet. Okay. So these conduit networks throughout Canada, be it TELUS, Bell, Roger Shaw, whomever, typically they're governed by an MAA or a municipal access agreement that is an agreement that says how we'll, um, how we'll use the conduit what sums of money trade hands, if any, and um, um, how long things are for, and so on. And so, if I realize this is a long time ago, hard to dig up records from way back when, but maybe one idea would be just to call up TELUS and ask them, uh, could you send us a copy of whatever permit you have to, to work within our municipality? And if they don't have one, you could just say, how about if we get together and uh, put a few thoughts down on paper and come up with an agreement. So if they have one and somebody from Tumblr Ridge signed it a long time ago, then you're probably bound by the terms of that and, and you could still have a conversation about it to get to a win-win situation where you have us build you, you know, a one gigabit network um, to every home if that's what people want. But if not, it it sort of um, gets them to prove that they have an agreement, and if not, then you could develop a municipal access agreement. And it doesn't have to be long, five or ten pages, which incorporates open access. And so for anyone who doesn't, um, isn't, you know, 100% certain what open access is, it's basically, it's like the roads within Tumblr Ridge or anywhere, anywhere else. Everybody gets to use them, and the conduit should be the same thing because when everybody gets to use it, 
you get competition. And of course, that's what you'd like to have. And we would like to build you a network that has um, TELUS there and uh, ourselves there, and it would open up future possibilities for you. But you really need the conduit. Right. And so if TELUS comes back with an agreement, um, next step would be to hire a telecom lawyer. They're not inexpensive. You know, they're sort of in the four to sometimes $600 an hour, but it's not a long engagement, and I've got access to a few of them in Vancouver that can take a look at something like this and, and tell you exactly where you stand and what you can do. But um, we've all been involved with numerous municipal access agreements and put, can put one together for Tugger Ridge, which you could then have vetted by a lawyer, because none of us are lawyers, and just try and get this fundamental thing out of the way um, which Jordan had tried to do back on uh, what was it, October 21st, 2019, when the staff report came out. Okay. So that to me is, is potentially um, a really good starting place. Let's figure out the conduit, and then we can build you a network. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree, Mark. Thank you for that. Um, just curious, Jody or, or Mark, possibly on the, uh, the main line backhaul, would it be accessing the TELUS line coming down Highway 52 North from Highway 97, or would there be a new backbone? That's a, a great question. I'm glad you brought that up, and it came up in some of my conversations with with industry as well, the, the coal mines who are looking for a diverse path. I think what we would recommend to start out with is to use the TELUS backhaul. Um, I think... I guess just to piggyback a little bit on Mark's comment, the good access, of course, makes the network and the build viable, um, but it's also, it, it could result in a pretty quick deployment of fiber and therefore a live network. And so building the backbone, there is the option to connect to our network in height. It would be about 165 kilometers. And we have done some preliminary costing on that route. Uh, that would just take a little bit longer, and I think we would have to make sure that we're really understanding all of the wants and needs from industry and uh, how to get that done. But I guess the short answer is we're definitely looking at diversity. Um, it's very possible for us to build from heights, and we have done some preliminary, preliminary work to understand what the cost would be, and that would also bring the added benefit of, of connecting industry along the way as well. Right, absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Jody. Council, any other questions? Councilor Lehman? Thank you, Eric. I'm just wondering if you've had any experience dealing with TELUS and if they don't give us access to the conduit, is this pretty well a done deal? I'm not sure if you got all that, Jody. Do you want them to repeat? Let's try that again. Sure, I did. Yeah. I, I did actually hear that if okay. TELUS doesn't give access to the duct, is it a done deal? Just to confirm, is, is that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Mark, I think you had something to say, and then and then I'll, um, I'll follow you. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a done deal. Um, it's, there are still your roads. It's still within um, the municipality of Timber Ridge, and of course you're the governing body, and you take care of all the roads, correct? Correct. Or it's not done by MOT, you do. No. So it, it's still your community, and that um, that holds some weight. The if it if the conversation went um, sideways a bit, just keep in mind that the Telecommunications Act was. It came about because of, not because of, but it was modeled after the Railway Act. And the Railway Act, if, if any of you know and or can imagine, wherever the railroad wanted to go a long time ago, it went. And it had federal government support. And telecommunications operates under the same principles as the, um, as the old Railway Act. But I think there's, there's lots of opportunity to discuss with them and find a way um, in order to use some of that because it's situated on your land and, and in your area. And if they were to do any more expansion, of course, you would, um, unless there's an agreement there that um, you signed that over a long time ago, 
Um, but I wouldn't say it's over at that point. Let's find out what they have. And if there is nothing, it presents a great opportunity to get started. I found in the past that uh, they're typically called support structure agreements in the TELUS world, and not a lot of them get signed. So they may have proposed one to you many years ago, but is it actually signed? Is it in effect? Probably not. Um, in fact, I'm not sure I've ever seen one that has actually been signed by TELUS. They typically are in the bigger cities, but um, myself and everybody else on this call deals primarily with rural broadband, and a lot of these agreements don't get signed um, by, the, by both counterparties. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, definitely an opportunity there for sure. Uh, any final questions, Council? Okay. Very much appreciate all of your time this evening, and thank you very much for the information, and uh, we'll surely be in touch here very shortly. Thank you very much, and if any other questions do come up, please don't hesitate to, to ask. I think we've provided a lot of information in a relatively short period of time, and we're all very open to questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Bye, Thank you, everyone. Participant exiting. Jared Kellett. Okay, moving on to consent agenda. Recommendation, please. Councillor Norbury. That all items in the, in the November 16th, 2020 consent agenda be moved for information. Seconder. Councillor Majinski. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. I'd like to bring up uh, 7.2 for discussion. Seconder, Councilor Majinski, all in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. Um, I did have some contact with Ms. Solomon in regards to the Mayor's Food Drive, and I'm absolutely in support of that, and I'd like to make a motion to schedule it for November 25th. Seconder, Councilor Norbury, discussion? Councilor Howe. So, do we have any concern with uh, what's going on with the pandemic? Yes. Having our fire department, I assume the fire department's going to go out again. And, you know, what, what, what would happen? Like, we're going to be getting in the faces of a lot of people by doing this. And so, what happens if our volunteer fire department gets affected by doing something like this where we put them out into the community? Um, you know, it's not such a big deal if someone on council gets it, but if our volunteer firefighters are down for two weeks because we've gone and done a food drive, is there not a better way for them to collect food this year in light of the circumstances? I, to, for, for me, I, I can't support this unless there's some other way that we can come up with for protecting the firefighters, and I, I don't think that this is a good idea this year. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely hear your concerns, and uh, Chief Curry and I and uh, Ms. Thompson have been in discussion in that and Chief Curry is um, developing a plan to keep us all safe um, for example um, only the firefighters are allowed in the uh, in the trucks and um, I'm not even sure if they they will be allowed to go and collect the food but uh, we're certainly Chief Curry is certainly uh, taking all things into consideration due to COVID. Councillor Norbury? Making sure I get my button on um yeah so it's not just the fire department that you know participates in this food drive they're just a part of, of the food drive i know myself i've been um, helping out for quite a few years i know i see Councilor kirby out there you know i see many people out there um and if the if there's concerns about the fire department and they aren't able to participate that would be a shame but the rest of us still can help and, and desire to help i mean i think we can find ways to do it and i think we should be supporting the food bank and the people in need um, by doing the best that we can under the circumstances to uh, get this done. Yep. Councillor Hall. And again, this gives us nine days between now and the 25th of November, right? That's, that's the day you're scheduling to do this. And the plan hasn't been formulated completely yet by uh, Fire Chief Curry, right? He's looking into it, trying to come up with some ways to do it. Um, not that I'm against the food bank or anything like that, but to me, there has to be a better way to do it this year. You know, I, I can't, again, can't support this at this time. Not that I'm against it, but it's, it's, it, 
do can we do that in nine days? Can we can we you know? And it's not only that. If anybody on the food drive is going home to home uh, and has that possibility that they have COVID and they can transmit it to every home in the community, it's a huge risk we're taking on. I mean, like you know, for nine months we haven't had the community center open for people to be able to go into it. You know, we have to have every person scheduled. You have to talk to somebody. You have to phone down. I mean, it's 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 quite complicated to get into the community center when you have that interaction with somebody on their doorstep that had no idea that you were coming. You can put in procedures all you want, but if you get that close interaction with somebody who doesn't know how they're supposed to deal with the encounter, uh, we put ourselves at risk. And, and to me, it just, you know, maybe this is not quite the right time. We haven't had any time to get any advertising out in nine days that we're even doing this. Uh, so just, is there a better way? Can we do something different? I uh, definitely hear your concern. Councillor Norbert. Thank you, Mayor Bertrand. I understand Councillor Howe's concerns about the complexity of the issue, but we could simplify that by just saying put your food on your doorstep. For people collecting the uh, bags of food, where it was. Mm -hmm. No contact, and we can still, you know, we can still provide a service to the community. Right? We're, we haven't shut down everything. We're still for business, and we should do the best that we can. Um, and you know our chief is in charge of checking protocols. I think he'll be able to find a safe way for us to do this. Yep, I agree. I, I have complete confidence in Chief Curry and his plan for this. We have been in conversation for a couple of weeks on this regard. Um, yeah, any other discussion? Call the question, all in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. Any other items to lift from the Consent Agenda Council? Okay, moving on to new business. 9.1, Council Budgeting Process Policy E0-8 Amendment, a report dated November 16, 2020 from the Director of Corporate Services with reasons for the proposed amendments. Recommendation, please. Councillor Kirby. The Council amends the Council Budgeting Process Policy e o Dash eight as presented. Seconder. Councillor Norbury. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Nine point two Economic Resiliency Task Force update. Report by the Director of Economic Development dated November 16, 2020, providing information to Council on the activities of this task force in its efforts to identify and mitigate the effects of COVID-19 pandemic in Tumbler Ridge. Recommendation, please. Councillor Krakowka. Move for discussion. Seconder. Councillor Majinski. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Councillor Krakowka. Yeah, so uh, going through this, I'm just wondering why we didn't put the terms of reference in the, in the back of the law. Uh, there seems to be some things that maybe aren't part of the terms of reference. I can't remember the terms of reference when we first uh, struck up the committee. There seems to be things being worked on that may not be as the terms of reference that are built for this committee. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I know I'll, there's some questions about moving things through and working on this and working on that. <clears throat> but my concern is 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 pushing this through and or agreeing to some of the ones that are questioning in here without seeing the terms of reference. And maybe it doesn't need to be part of that task. Yep. Yep. Certain. Certainly, um, Ms. Thompson can, or or Mr. Powell can get you a copy of that. Most definitely. Any other discussion? Councillor Norbury. Um, I am just, I'm just curious on if minutes are made available for this task force that we can see or the public can see, or is it um, confidential? Um, not 100% sure. I don't believe it's confidential. Um, Ms. Thompson. Thank you, Mayor Bertrand, through Council. Um, I would have to look into it. I'm not certain of the terms of reference and how everything was, but I will pass it over to Mr. Powell to comment. Thank you. Mayor Council, thank you. Um, yes, if you look on the investtumbleridge.ca website, there is a section dedicated to the task force, and in there you will find the terms of reference, you'll find the agendas and minutes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Any other discussion? Councillor Hall? Do you have... Uh, 
on page 60, it talks about the uh, <coughs> survey that was sent out. Do you remember what the response was from that survey? From what I remember, it wasn't a, a fantastic response from the community or the businesses. Yeah. Remember, did we get 10% back or something like that? I think, it was, I think it was between 10 and 20%, Ms. Thompson. I'll have Mr. Powell respond to that as well. Uh, again, without checking the numbers, I can't uh, answer that. But uh, on the uh, the, uh, the uh, survey questions and responses are uh, on the website again, <laughs> uh, So on the uh, on response templates, uh, there is information about numbers. Councilor Norbury. That's why I'm pushing the thing. <laughs> <laughs> On the uh, survey, is there an, a survey plan in the future? Because there's a lot that's been changed in uh, the economy and people's situation since May. No, not currently. There hasn't been another plan for another survey. Um, interesting point, though. It, it definitely has changed a little bit uh, as far as economy and everything. Councillor Norbury? And, and the reason why I ask is, you know, I was playing around, around on <clears throat> um, Stats Canada and it would be seeing what like, the year compared to last year and understanding the situation that we're in now, like uh, I'll use an example, like unemployment is down 3% compared to last year. Now, unless more participants join, this conference will end in now, five minutes. <laughs> I think it's important Enter star to one to cancel and continue and the conference. In the pandemic, when uh, there was a lot of potential layoffs, the situation uh, was much worse, right? Like there was, a, you know, I, I think I saw like there was a 10% loss of jobs in comparison. Now, you know, the economy is slowly on the rise. So I think it gave us a lot of Yeah, interesting point there. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Hal? I have a question on the, the worm farm on page 63. So I thought the worm farm was dead in the water. Uh, council already stated that we didn't have an interest in pursuing this. So uh, why are we going down this road with this committee if the council of the day has already spoken and said we didn't want to do it? Why would this committee pick something up like that and waste the EDO's time with it? Uh, it was a discussion within the task force in regards to food security, but um, PRD is also looking for pilot projects um, for vermicomposting. Um, I don't remember uh, being a motion of voting in town. I think we just had a, a delegation in to um, present the, the proposal, but uh, I don't remember uh, us debating or, or voting any on anything of that. Um, but it's, it's an interesting idea, and it's uh, something the PRD is definitely pursuing in the region um, on the backs of uh, Fort Nelson's success. So, yeah. Councillor Krakowka. Yeah, I actually remember the, the delegation there. I, I, did, I don't think it was a motion, as your worship just said. I thought the feeling around council that it was nothing, something that we wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. So. Financially, yeah. Well, we're putting finances into it now. Mm -hmm. Through community futures, the real dividend funding. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize the task force could spend um, that kind of dollars. No. Given a budget. Yeah, we were given a budget within the task force, but we're not spending uh, rural dividend money on on it. Go ahead. But you just seen it seemed like to me this 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 organizer or this task force given directions to the EDO to move forward and working within this project. No, that's the exact rural dividend fund is already available to your community futures. The EDO, the EDO has actioned the RT initiate partnership with community futures to explore this. Mm. Yeah. Um, Maybe Mr. Powell could expand on it, but as far as I understand, we, we haven't um, made this an action item like to uh, pursue without district consent, that's for sure. Ms. Thompson? I'll have Mr. Powell answer. Thank you, uh, Mayor Council. Um, so yes, this was just a uh, topic of conversation. We were looking at uh, food security and uh, other associated uh, issues that came out of the surveys uh, with the, the community and the business service. So uh, it was something we looked into with uh, in partnership with Community Futures. There, was no, uh, there were no costs associated with this to the, uh, to the task force budget. 
uh, this was purely paid for through the rural dividend. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Okay. Any other discussion? Councilor Howe. Just one last point again. I, I thought the uh, Economic Resiliency Task Force, as it states in here a few different times, was to deal with the economic resiliency of the community. And I, I, to me, I feel like this this has gone off in a different direction here. And I just wanted to state that, that uh, you know, I think that it would be better suited that we stay on economic resiliency instead of worrying about food security, uh, financial management for individuals, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely not what I thought that this committee was going to be about. So, uh, and, you know, the response from the survey being 10 to 12 percent from what I remember, uh, participation in the webinar that's been poorly attended, uh, you know, I, I almost don't know what's the point of having the committee anymore or the task force anymore. Thank you. Councillor Norbury. Thank you, Mayor Bertrand. You know, to, to Councillor Howe, um, I believe this council, through a motion made by Councillor Kalka, voted yourself on to the task force to, and you know, I voted in favor of that so that you could potentially bring these issues to the task force. And I hope that in that, um, I agree with you. I'd like to see see those initiatives put forward through. So I hope that um, you are doing that in your uh, representation of this council on that task force. Thank you. Councillor Kalka. I'm just wondering if we can have this added to the next meeting agenda with the terms of reference. So it can be discussed a little bit more in thorough in regards to some of the items that are marked here, because maybe something gets pulled out of here. I'm not saying staff doesn't work on it, it's not part of the task force. Yeah, Anything, maybe? yeah, I see what you're saying, absolutely. Um, I was hoping to discuss the task force and the uh, ECDEV strategy at our next PMP meeting to uh, really break it down. Or open it up, I guess. Councilor Krakowka. So, do we need a motion to have this move to that meeting with the terms of reference being added? No, no, I'll make, make sure of that. Yep. Any other discussion? Okay, moving on. 9.3 report from the Director of Economic Development and Tourism dated November 16th, 2020, requesting direction from Council on the Welcome to Tumblr signage as a result of un unanticipated problems and delays with this project. Recommendation, please. Councilor Kalka. I'm just wondering before we make the recommendation, we can get an overview from staff. Um, and the reason I asked that, I've read through the report, but the reason I asked that is just to explain it a bit more in thorough because I believe the motion when we approved these signs was for staff to decide where they went, where they went, whether they were hooked to power or they went soon. And now I'm concerned when I read some of this about uh, where the placement was, it was ended up being under power lines, so they couldn't put this in and do that in. But it was chosen by them. Uh, to me, it looks like there's an over amount to have them lit up. Yep. Yep. Ms. Thompson, could you give us an overview, please? Thank you, Member Trans Council. So, once the permits were put into Modi um, to get approval for them, and everything seemed fine, but then Modi came back and said that we needed a structural engineering done on the signs. So, within our contingency, we were able to do the signs, but now with the solar panels, because of the weight, um, we need additional funds in order to put those bases in for the solar panels um, and the pole. So as we are currently would be going over the budget that was there, we're asking Council's approval to either do a spring installation or a fall installation or winter installation right now. And there currently is some money in the overall capital budget that we could use for this, but as we would be over budget, we are coming back and requesting additional funds. And from what I remember, Councillor, um, we had the choice and cost breakdown between the hard power and the solar, and I believe at that time Council decided to go with the solar based on the cost. Uh, Ms. Thompson, do you have cost estimates for hard power in this situation? I will have uh, Mr. Powell answer that. So the... Uh So yes, the final paragraph of the uh, background section of the report uh, did talk about uh, the option of putting a transformer into the power lines uh, for the Chetwin access point. And 
and uh, we're looking at it within the quote around about 50,000 for that uh, for that transformer. So uh, you know, really, with the costs that we're quoting now, it would still be uh, a more expensive option to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Councilor Krakalka. Yeah, yes, I, I, and uh, thanks for the information. When these were brought forward to us, yes, it, it had the price of sign and a breakdown of the power costs, but it was up to staff. I mean, we approved the one budget and that was supposed to include lighting, right? So that was their choice to, to find the location that would work, whether they went with solar, because I know I, I, uh, I did ask those questions. We decided the motion was to leave it up to staff whether they live powered them or solar, depending on where they were being placed. Okay. So, you know, I mean, I guess wait for what the rest of the council to but maybe that, that those motions should come back to us. With those three options again? Well, no, no, like not three options, but just so we know what we, what we gave direction to, or at least look it up. Mm. I mean, I have an issue when it comes back, and we're now asking for another one, $21,000. Mm. We, we put three signs in at 30 some odd thousand a sign. Mm. And now we're asking for another $21,000. Mm. You know, we, Argued and argued and delayed the sign installation because oh that one was too much send stop that well that one's still too much send stop that so we, to me we got a budget for three signs we knew what the budget was and that included them being lit up and now we're coming back I'm just concerned yep. you know we're hearing a lot or I, I know personally I've heard a lot in regards to the cost of the signage that has been installed and I support that when council decided and I voted in favor of the, the signs that were chose. I mean, for them to be lit up. My understanding when we asked this question a few, I don't know if it was a month ago after they were installed, what the delay was, was getting them lit up, was they were behind on the components due to the COVID. Mm -hmm. To me, is it, was that the case or was it we needed more funds and hadn't come to ask? I think it's a combination of both now, yeah. Any other, uh, I think we should throw a motion on the floor so we can debate it. Council prepared for a motion. Councilor Norbury. Well, I'll, uh, I'll make a motion to get the conversation started at the least. Thank you. Council approved the fall 2020 installation of the solar panel foundations and poles due to structural change requirements and an estimated cost of $21,500. Second it. I'll second it, or sorry, thank you. Discussion. Councillor Howe. So I see a note in here, it says screw piles are not an option due to close proximity of the drill to overhead power lines. So that isn't a problem on at least two of the signs. There's, so is screw piles an option on two, but not on a third? I'm not sure. Ms. Thompson? Thank you, Member Transfer Council. So I know that it's, it is good on, or there's two, two of the signs are going to be solar and the other sign is going to be powered. Okay, that's new information. Yeah, um, that I had understood that all three of them were going to be solar, but I can hand that over to Mr. Powell to for more detail. Thank you. Yes, so the uh, the boundary approach is going to be connected up to the power lines, uh, which is just adjacent. The other two are to be connected up to. Uh, so, thank you, Councillor Howe. So, with that in mind, uh, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of a fall. If we are going to spend more money to do this, I'm certainly not in favor of continuing it into the fall. Um, it would have been nice to have it for the winter, but it doesn't, to me, the additional cost for us to hoard and heat during the winter doesn't make sense. We can save almost $7,000 if we wait to spring to do it. So, I will be against this motion for that reason. Thank you. Any other discussion? <clears throat> I'm in agreement with Councillor Howe. I think uh, the lighting can definitely wait till the spring, and hopefully uh, um, there isn't any other cost overruns on the parts because of the delay. But um, yeah, at, at this point, I'm in not in favor of the recommendation on the floor. Any other discussion? Okay, call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Defeated. Thank you, Councillor Norbury. Okay, rule well, option B, that council delay installation of the electrical foundations and poles until the spring of 2021. Seconder, Councillor Lehman, any more comments? Councillor Majinski? 
Uh, in regards to the installation, are we still bound to the installers at putting the signs originally, or if we do this in the spring, can we find somebody else? I'm not sure. Ms. Thompson? Thank you, River Transit Council. Um, I believe that it is part of the contract and we are delaying. We would have to definitely reread our contract, but I believe we would still be bound with who we have selected. Go ahead. Okay, if we're going to continue with the existing install uh, contractor that's doing the installation, was it their responsibility to reach out to Modi for the pads and everything else? Uh, for the proper structures, for the poles and everything else? Was that all under their contract or was that part of the district's responsibility to have that information provided for them? Ms. Thompson. Thank you. I will pass that to Mr. Powell as I wasn't, I'm not completely aware of all the discussions that were, were had. Thank you. So the uh, public process was uh, uh, to myself along with the um, system. Urban systems. So, no, it was not the responsibility of the contract. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Howe? Will the boundary one be lit up by, uh, by winter, though? For so the hard power? Put in a foundation or anything? Like, we just run hard power? Good question, Ms. Thompson. Mr. Powell? <laughs> uh, we could, but it would be an extra expense because that the money that we are. Uh, we budgeted is for them to come out once okay. to understand. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other comments, <coughs> questions? Call the question, all in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. 9.4 CSA certification of Baylor, a report by the Director of Operations and Infrastructure dated November 16, 2020. The status update on the implementation of curbside recycling. Recommendation, please. Councilor Norbury. For information. Seconder. Councilor Kirby. All in favor? Opposed? Can we do that again? All in favor, please? Opposed? Carry, I believe. Thank you. 9.5 UBCM grant funding regarding flatbed creek erosion. A report from the Director of Operations and Infrastructure dated November 16, 2020. Requesting Council support for an application under the Union of BC Municipalities Structural Flood Mitigation Grant to fund erosion protection along the bank of Flatbed Creek. Recommendation, please. Councillor Howe. Council supports the application for the Union of British Columbia Municipalities UBCM structural flood mitigation grant to fund erosion protection along the bank of Flatbed Creek adjacent to the Lions Flat Flatbed Creek Campground and two, that council directs staff to provide overall grant management as required. Seconder, Councillor Kirby. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. 9.6 2020 council meeting schedule a report by the director of corporate services dated november 16 2020 with a draft calendar attached showing the proposed schedule for council meetings in 2021 uh, before recommendation miss thompson would you like to give a overview on this please yes thank you member so when we staff were preparing the meeting schedule um, you will notice that we do have a full meeting schedule for the summer months, July, August, as well as in December. And we've also scheduled separate budget meetings, uh, January, February, and March. So council may change that at this time, or you can leave it scheduled and then council cancel meetings if there is nothing on the agenda. I prefer to keep the meeting scheduled and we can always cancel them. It is a little bit easier than creating special meetings, so. Thank you. Recommendation, please. Councillor Krakowka. So before I make the res recommendation, uh, Ms. Thompson just mentioned in regards to budget, if you wanted to change it. I'm just asking through to you, Your Worship, three budget meetings. I, I did, did read it later on in the agenda in regards to our budget process. Uh, I'm just wondering if that's enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't even discussed as a council what 
Well, we did. We did the. Uh, <coughs> strategic plan. Sorry. Strategic plan. Strategic plan. But there might be other ideas from council. And I, I understand staff has to work on those again, cost bottom down. And I understand how we're how it's going to work in regards to planning. But three meetings concern me. Yeah, I definitely hear that concern, and um, I think, I've, from what I recall last year, we didn't have these um, um, actual meetings for the budget. We just had it locked into a, a regular agenda, so uh, I did talk with Ms. Thompson about that today in regards, and um, she felt a, a possible three-hour meeting all on its own is, is sufficient, but um, it's really the will of council. Councillor Hall. Yeah, and I, I prefer more time for the budget meetings as well. Like, uh, and to me, I, I remember separate budget meetings that were cancelled. What I remember from the previous year, That's we true. had previous ones set. We used some of them, and then we cancelled others along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I certainly do believe that between January, February, and March, we should allot at least an hour of every one of those meetings for some portion of budgeting. There's a lot to go over in budgeting, and I find that we whip through it, and we always get down to the wire, which is what, May 15th is when the budget has to be submitted to the government, and then we're always coming in, well, we got to get in, we got to approve this, then we got to come in tomorrow, and we got to approve that. We're always down to the wire to get that done, and uh, to me, I've never liked the, the way that we do budgets like that. I don't find that we have enough time to get in-depth into them enough, uh, and I think this could be a very interesting budget season going forward, what's happened with COVID and this year, so... Uh, to me, if, if we are scheduling a little bit of time in each one of those meetings in, in the regular meetings of council, and even p, &P for that matter, uh, then I, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with the way the meeting schedule is set up. I, I do think that you should have uh, May 15th on the, on the back burner there, though, too. Everyone should be aware that that is the date, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Good suggestion. <laughs> Recommendation, please. Councilor Kirkalka. Just wondering if you want a motion to make those changes, Council. I would follow with Council, obviously. I honestly don't believe three Council meetings or three budget meetings. Should no. mm -hmm. so we make a motion to do that? Same time that we have staff to to have an hour, approximately an hour budget on all three meetings previous to the budget meeting on every month? Does that need to be a motion? Ms. Thompson, do you require a motion on that? Thank you, Mayor Trent. Yes, we can um, just go as amended. Um, we can make the motion as amended. Back. According to these recommendations, you, you mean? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Hall? And, and just to add some more flavor to that is that we don't have to use them if we don't want to, but we know that they're scheduled. We have an hour in each meeting that we should be prepared for to be here for our three-hour meeting, that there may be a portion that we need, and we may have to bump other stuff further out so that we have that hour saved for our budget meeting. Yeah, I um, I could definitely see opening one of the budgets up on the P and P's scheduled. Uh, we could definitely designate the whole P and P to open and talk about uh, either one of the budgets. Um, yeah, I don't know. Will a council, Councillor Norbert? Thank you, Mayor Bertrand. Um, I think in the last two years we've been able to do the budget during a regular um, meeting schedule without extra meetings present um, created with the exception of getting the final readings done and that wasn't any deliberation on the actual budget it was just we had to have get our procedural ducks in a row so to speak go to our readings and, and move on but the actual dealings of the budget we managed to deal do in a regular meeting schedule mm -hmm. so um, I understand the willingness to add extra time we are adding extra meeting every single month to deal with just the budget. I would be concerned. I, mean, I think we would be fine with this. <clears throat> Any other comments? Councillor Majinski. No, I'm, I'm okay with everything here as long as we have time allotted just in case for an hour or whatever you need. I'm okay with just amending the motion that's presented here. Okay. Councillor Kirkalka. Yeah, put the motion on the floor. <clears throat> the council receives a report from the Director of Corporate Service regarding 2020 
2021 council meeting schedule and the council approves the 2021 council meeting schedule as amended. Amend. Seconder. Councilor Kirby. Any more discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And 9.7 2020 schedule of meetings. Any issues, Council? Okay. Notice of motions. Ten point one emergency services, Councillor Krakalka. The council directs staff to prepare a report on emergency service volunteer personnel status and what we can do to assist them. Seconder, Councillor Norbury. Discussion. I just have a quick question, Councillor. Um, just wondering. What all emergency services are included in this? So we're talking about the volunteer fire department, Councilor Krakalka? Yeah, we're just looking at the, well, the motion was for the volunteer fire department, but I think volunteer personnel, I mean, it's through the emergency services, and we only take care of volunteer mm -hmm. So there's anything else that's volunteering through, whether it's um, search and rescue or whatever, it's a volunteer department. Thank you. Any other discussion? Councilor Majinski? Um, is there any more information of what kind of guidance we can give to staff for how we'd like to help them? Is it monetary or is it uh, doing um, something to promote getting more volunteers involved, uh, reaching out, putting out newsletters, uh, multiple ways we could go about this? Is there something in particular you'd like to do or is that all in the hands of the staff? Uh, Councilor Krakalka. I'd like to see it come back from staff. Uh, I mean, I can't say who's going to do the report. I would think it's our, our emergency uh, director who will do it, who's in charge of our volunteer fire department. So there is different initiatives out there. Um, but I think with the numbers, uh, I don't want to quote what, what they are because I don't remember the number that Mr. Curry gave. But there is some concerns, that, uh, burnout, COVID. So maybe there's something this council needs to look at for this budgeting uh, coming up in 2021. And whether that's paid on call, on pager, uh, something else, more more advertising money, uh, trying to move more partnership with the mines, uh, the wind, and, you know, local businesses, making sure they're on board to allow staff to leave if if so need be. I mean, not all businesses are uh, noted to be able to do that. Maybe they can't because there's only one employee in the store, or they're okay with it, and the, the department knows that they can solicit that business to get more manpower or lead power. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. 10.2, review of the district's investments. I'll move that council ask staff to perform an investment review report for council's information in order to achieve maximum investment income. Seconder? Councillor Lehman? Discussion? Councillor Norbury? Um, with this report, can we also include guidelines for um, municipalities for how they can invest? I think that is also important for us to realize that we are bound by um, laws and how we can invest. I think that would be important to get a review because I know a little bit, but it would get. I would appreciate to know. Everything. Absolutely, yeah. There's definitely a lot of rules there and restrictions. Good point. Any other discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Councillor's business. Anything, Councillor? Councillor Kirby? Thank you, Mayor Bertrand. Um, just a, a topic came up at our last TAC meeting, and it was a, uh, around the round table. The roundtable that you hold with the nonprofit groups. Mm. Um, nonprofits are having some troubles organizing events and getting um, event notices kind of grouped together. Um, even ice times at the arena with with the community center closed. So, just some concerns on on just event planning, getting back out to the community, and whether you would be having or organizing another 
roundtable for nonprofits? Uh, excellent. Yes. Um, so that usually there was um, combined with the Let's Talks. Um, yeah. Thank you for bringing that forward. I'll definitely look into that. Councillor Kurkauka. Yeah, I believe in our last Let's Talk we did that. That was being taken over by the Community Center mm. Roundtables. Mm. So maybe that used to be a reach out to staff to find out. It could be an issue with COVID. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But I, I would definitely um, think a meeting of the minds to try and find a path forward for everybody in regards to all of our nonprofits would probably be very beneficial. Good. Thank you. Any other councillors' business? Okay. I um, recently attended a meeting with uh, School District 59 and uh, Mrs. Hewitt and our new principal, Mr. Brandon Bogley. I hope I said that right. Um, yeah, he's uh, very keen and uh, loves Tumblr Ridge and, and also wanted to give a shout out to our Act Dev department to, uh, because of the fact of all of the information uh, that was available to them online, they were able to comfortably move sight unseen to Tumblr Ridge and is absolutely uh, loving it and enjoying it. And um, I think he's doing a great job so far from what I've heard. So. Uh, we did talk about um, some of the trades programs through the um, high school and Northern Lights College and also um, uh, some concerns around uh, Northern Lights College and uh, the lack of use. So um, just an action item for me to try and um, set up another meeting with Northern Lights College to discuss. And that's about it for me. Councilor Majinski. I just had a question on the Northern Lights College. We did have a discussion about having a bus and service. Um, do you know what had happened with that? And if it just wasn't enough interest, or is it because of COVID now? Or? Yeah, at the time, there wasn't enough interest. There was uh, initially about 11 students that would have been interested. Um, delay on, on trying to, to find a, a good solution to the problem uh, caused it to drop down to six, I believe, that attended that year. And uh, currently we have one attending this year. So it's it's definitely an issue still. Um, but it, it, it unfortunately, it, there wasn't anybody that stepped up to the plate to, uh, to make it happen. So, yeah. Councillor Howe. Just with your uh, discussions with the new principal, I think it's Mr. Uh, Bogle. So Bogle, 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 Brandon Bogle. Um, you know, did you have an opportunity to talk to him about funding at all? You know, we, we talked a lot in here about education being a priority or one of our pillars that we want to try to help in our community. Did you have an opportunity to talk to him at all about it, if there's any way that the district of Tumblr Ridge could help fund uh, any special initi initiatives similar to like uh, the fish farm or the woods shop or you know they finally have woods open again but the way i understand it, they have no materials down there uh, i talked to the science teacher down there last week and he has a very limited budget he's using product that has uh, years and years and years ago uh, been left over and i just thought that you know if you had an opportunity to talk to him to say you know maybe there's something that we could do we could financially uh, put a little money into the schools that don't just get filtered throughout their budgets that go directly into some of these teachers' hands that want to do uh, special things for the kids in the classrooms. I don't know if that's worth thinking about, but. Yeah, no, we didn't discuss that. Um, honestly, he didn't bring it up as an issue, but uh, we can. I can certainly explore that. Councilor Norbert? You know, to give, to give other options for yourself and Councilor Howe when those discussions arise, the community forest is always um, looking forward to community um, Partnerships, and you know, we have supported schools in the past um, in terms of like digital um, technologies. And um, I can't speak for the board because it all does go to a board. But if there are any shortfalls there for programs and stuff, um, I, would, I would love to hear from them. Yeah, I'll definitely mention that. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, any other council business? Question and answer period. Hi, Trent. So this is uh, probably into the weeds and above your pay grade, but is there um, eminent and domain laws in BC? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Basically looking at the, the fiber optic discussion, is there eminent domain laws? Basically that's where, oh, we're building a road through here, we're buying your house, no, you don't have a say in it. Is there a, an option to say, 
thanks for having this infrastructure here that was built by a different company. We're going to pay you and then take over the, the conduit. Is that an option? As far as another company coming in besides? No, as far as the municipality coming in and saying, for the good of the district, this is now public property. Oh, I see what you're saying. So like the district would take over the conduit? Yeah. It's called, it's called eminent domain in the states. Yeah, I, um, I don't think we're at that point at the moment. We definitely have to discover uh, the ins and outs of the conduit. But um, yeah, there hasn't been any discussion of that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Resolution to close. Recommendation that the meeting be closed to the public in accordance with the Community Charter Section 91B D and J and section 92B as follows. 91C, labor relations or other employee relations. D, the security of the property of the municipality. J, information that is prohibited or information that if it were presented in a document would be prohibited from disclosure under section 21 of the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act. And 92B, the consideration of information received and held in confidence relating to negotiations between the municipality and a provincial government or federal government or both and a third party. Seconder? Councillor Lehman? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. 10 minute recess, please.